Uh, welcome everybody, my name is Gabe Scheinman, I'm the Executive Director of the Alexander Hamilton Society. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, and, and that's probably few since we have many alumni in the crowd, uh, we're a nonprofit organization based here in D.C., uh, dedicated to identifying, educating, and launching uh, young people such as yourself into American foreign policy, national security, imbued with what we call Hamiltonian perspective, which uh, I usually would explain, but normally I can now just actually hold up this book, which I think kind of explains it probably a little better than I do. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about what we do, you can go to our website, www.alexanderhamiltonsociety.org, or talk to uh, Sydney or Eamon, who are roaming around here somewhere. Um, this event is co-sponsored with our good friends at the Her Talk Foundation, um, and the Her Talk Foundation runs a series of both weekend seminars and summer programs on a variety of topics, in particular political philosophy, um, uh, grand strategy, uh, uh, economic policy and such, and you can find out more about those programs at hertalkfoundation.org or, or speak with Cheryl, uh, who's right here, or Mary Elizabeth, uh, or Sydney, who's also roaming around somewhere. Tonight, uh, in our iteration of series with dinners, uh, series with food, I guess, uh, with authors of new books about the American role in the world, uh, this book makes the case for a very specific American role in the world. Now, most people, or most of the time when we talk about this, we're talking about policeman, sheriff, cowboy, superpower, hegemon, empire, so on. But today it's sort of a term, the first one, the first time I've heard this sort of term, which is uh, America the landscaper. Uh, so you know, the landscaping is the thing that uh, you need to do, but you don't want to, then you hire somebody to do it. Uh, it always costs more than you expect. Uh, they always show up later uh, and inconsistently. You think you can do it yourself, so you get rid of them. In the end, you can't, you're overwhelmed, and you call them back in. And at some point, you realize that it's actually quite important. Um, and so here tonight with us, we have Bob the Landscaper. I thought, I thought I'd overplayed this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm time. trying. <laughs> so Bob Kagan is the Stephen and Barbara Friedman Senior Fellow with the Project International Order and Strategy and Foreign Policy at the Brookings Institution. He's also a contributing columnist at the Washington Post and the author of several must-read books in what I consider the American foreign policy canon, including The World America Made, Return of History and the End of Dreams, uh, Dangerous Nation, America's Place in the World from its Earliest Days to the Dawn of the 20th Century, and Of Paradise and Power. And he's here with us with his newest book, which we're giving out uh, somewhere in the back there, The Jungle Grows Back, America in Our Imperiled World. And so what I figured I'd do is give Bob a few minutes really to make the case for the book, on um, the case for the ideas and principles that he's putting forward in it, uh, and then I'll open with a few questions and conversation, and then really have a conversation amongst all of us. So Bob, thank you for being here, and thank you for the book. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me here, and I, it really is a pleasure to be speaking to all of you who are part of uh, two programs that I think maybe are the most important things going on in Washington right now, and I, I would probably say beyond Washington as well. I can't think of uh, anybody doing more valuable work uh, than these two organizations and than you all uh, who have participated in them. And, uh, given my view of the world uh, and its prospects going forward, uh, you are going to have an immense challenge ahead of you, uh, but I, it makes me feel better knowing that you're all out here uh, and preparing for that challenge. So thank you for having me and thank you for doing all the things that you do. Uh, I know I, it's hard for me to, for anybody to summarize a book in five minutes. Let me just say that um, one of the goals of this book is to be alarming. I, I actually think there is reason for alarm. And I think that the reason I feel it's necessary to, to make it uh, that uh, alarming is that we really have developed a tendency after seven decades to think that uh, things work out ultimately. Uh, that is our experience. You know, the Cold War, people were in a panic about nuclear war, they were in a panic about communism, they were, you know, a, a year before the end of the Cold War, uh, Paul Kennedy wrote a book talking about how the U.S. was practically out of business, and all these predictions turned out to be wrong, and we ultimately prevailed and very effectively and avoided all those worst catastrophes. And so I think our general tendency is to assume that that's just the way things are. But I really think it's important to, you know, know enough history to know that sometimes the catastrophes actually do happen, uh, and that it really is uh, the result of a tremendous amount of effort, expenditure of resources, and concern, and fear, both legitimate and exaggerated, that led us, in a way, to make it through all those difficult periods. And I, and I worry today that we've been made, understandably, but nevertheless, troublingly complacent, 
about things going forward. Uh, I base this on the, on the, on the premise that uh, there's no such thing as human <coughs> progress. I don't mean there's no such thing as scientific progress. I don't mean there's no such thing as the progress of knowledge, because clearly there are. Uh, there is progress in both those areas, and we've seen it. But when it comes to the behavior of human beings, morality, politics, I think progress is an illusion. And we've been living in a period of enormous progress, but that progress has been based on an underlying structure of power in the international system power that's favored a certain set of enlightenment ideals uh, by and large, power that has kept the peace among great powers, power that has made possible uh, the growth of an enormous uh, period of prosperity, uh, but it is all very fragile. Uh, and as the power structure changes, if, if the nation that is at the core of that structure no longer wishes to play that role, as other powers rise and geopolitics continues as always, uh, things can go in a bad direction much, much faster than we, we think they can. Um, if you just try to imagine what the world looked like in, say, 1928, uh, the year of the Kellogg-Briand Pact, uh, two years after the Peace of Locarno, the American economy was booming, German democracy seemed troubled but nevertheless settled. The Nazis got the worst vote that they the, that they had in several elections. Japanese democracy seemed in relatively good shape. Mm. You know, all you have to do is then fast forward <coughs> five years. In five years Hitler is in power. In five years the Japanese have invaded Manchuria. In five years the world has settled into the Great Depression. So things happen faster than we think. And so uh, I'm not going to go through the whole uh, argument because uh, Dave's going to ask me a lot of <laughs> penetrating and tough questions that I hope I'll be able to answer, but we'll probably bring out uh, the argument. But uh, you're all doing the right thing by being concerned about these issues. That's all I can say. Thanks. Great. Um, so let me uh, let me ask first, did you get to pick the title? Because sometimes that doesn't always the case. Not only did I pick the title, the title is the book. I mean, I've had to write a book to like service the title. Because <laughs> I can push you on the word more specifically. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. so when I think of jungle, there's different archetypes that right. I think. The first act is actually biblical. You say it's Garden of Eden, but you actually read it, it really feels more like a jungle, one that's supposed to be perfection with one sole temptation. Another is uh, Kipling, Jungle Book, right? Which is uh, jungle is neither I'm good mostly. Near, right? <laughs> <laughs> the jungle is neither good nor bad, but there's actually a certain law and order within the jungle. Certain animals know their place and the hierarchy and how one interacts with another. And the third is actually the Guns N' Roses song, if people remember that. <laughs> Welcome to the Jungle. Which I can I wrote the lyrics down Would here. Would you sing it for us? I, I can, I can, uh, I can uh, what's a poetry slam? Is that the, uh, but it's, you know, Welcome to the Jungle, we've got fun and games, and it's all about, really, temptation and greed and immorality and so on. So, uh, with these sort of architects in mind, perfection, neutrality, good, neither good nor evil, it depends, and maybe really evil, this jungle that you speak of, this, this the world that you see, how do you describe it? How do you? What archetype does it fit for you? What I really mean is it's nature. Um, <laughs> and when I think of when I use the word jungle, I wasn't being specific about a, you know an African jungle or a tropical rainforest or anything like that. I actually was mostly thinking about uh, a garden in my backyard, which ultimately becomes looking like a garden, uh, like a jungle, because if you leave a garden alone, and I'm really just talking about the natural forces of history, uh, natural forces of human nature, the natural tendencies of the international system, which if you, if the metaphor is that if you plant a garden, uh, first of all, a garden is an unnatural creation, it's a human creation, other than God, I suppose, uh, made, uh, gardens don't appear unless someone builds them. Um, but you also know that you don't plant a garden uh, and then fold your arms and say you're done and walk away and expect to find the garden there that next week because forces of nature are constantly striving to take back the land that you've cultivated weeds and vines and everything else and so um, the, the point of this uh, metaphor which you know you always regret every metaphor you ever came up with so Mar I, I had to spend years after I wrote a book about Mars and Venus talking about well Jupiter is this and Saturn is that and get up and do what you just did and really really you know make me regret that I ever used the metaphor but uh, my, my purpose here is to is basically to say the order that we've been living in is an artificial creation 
Uh, the question is not why is it going to collapse, the question is how could it possibly not collapse? Because there are always these forces at work uh, that want to take this order down. The international system heads naturally toward chaos and conflict. Order is something that is imposed. Uh, it can be imposed in a good way, it can be imposed in a bad way, but it's an imposition. Uh, and similarly, in the case of human nature, human nature is a struggle of competing instincts. And we like to privilege the ones that want freedom and democracy and liberalism, but we know, and we look all around us, that there are other aspects of human nature too. And so those are the things that, um, that come back as the jungle if you aren't constantly weeding and cutting vines and pushing it back. So if there was another title for the book, it would probably be, this was not inevitable. Because it see, it's, when I read the book, it seems like every 10 or 15 pages, you really tried to drive the point home that this was, that the, the liberal, American liberal order you described was a conscious choice. First, maybe by Woodrow Wilson, that kind of failed, but certainly by FDR and Truman, and then I'll quote you, it's the only, the only alternative was for the United, States, the United States itself to play the central role in creating and defending a new liberal order, even if that meant shouldering new international responsibilities in perpetuity. This was not idealistic hubris. It was a practiced response to changing geopolitical consequences. Okay. Yet you also describe how the United States is the sole actor able, willingness is a different question, but sole actor able to actually make this choice, to build and maintain this order because of its so-called naturally endowed advantages in geography and resources and political culture. So on the one hand, you seem to be arguing the United States or America is exceptional by its very nature. But on the other hand, the role that it plays is actually exceptional by choice. So I was wondering if you could, how do you square those two perspectives in that way? Yeah, I mean, when, when you think about, when it's a very, obviously people argue a lot about what it means to talk about America as an exceptional nation. And I certainly don't mean that Americans are exceptionally wonderful people or exceptionally smart people or exceptionally brilliant strategists because none of those things are true. Uh, much of our exceptionalism is a, is a product of geography and wealth. Now, you could say that the wealth is a product of a particular political system and a particular economic system that created that wealth. Uh, but even a wealthy country couldn't play the role that the United States played did we not have this unique geography. You could say, obviously, it's advantageous, but it's more important for me that it's unique in the sense that only the United States could be a great power not threatened by any other great power in its uh, in its immediate environs, and hunter and caravans don't count. Um, so, it, so it's secure in its home, and therefore able to take the bulk of what can be its substantial military capacity, send them 3,000 miles away in both directions, and leave them there. No other power, every other power in history, if it gets as strong as the United States does, is surrounded by other great powers who were immediately panicked by that nation's power, and therefore are immediately responding to it by building up their own. Uh, it's what the, one of the most striking aspects of this period is the degree to which the other great powers of the world have fundamentally not responded to the growth of American power by either uh, getting together amongst themselves to put it down, or by increasing their own defense capacities to try to equal that of the United States. And so. That is a situation which means that, in a way, only, and this is the this is sort of what happened to Americans. This was the unwanted, in a way, unwanted reality that Americans confronted in World War One, after World War One, throughout the interwar period, and then in World War Two and the aftermath. Which was, it wasn't a question of whether we wanted to play this role. Clearly, we didn't want to play it. Uh, it, was the, it was the fact that only we could play this role, and if we didn't play it, then the world would continue to be in the kind of chaotic, conflictual situation that we found it in. So um, that is, exceptional is not even, it's, it, it, what it means is this order in a way is so accidental, it, it is such a product of particular circumstances, that this is, in my view, why international relations theory has no way of comprehending what this is. We keep trying to squeeze it into known models of international behavior, but it's a completely new model. So it's fitting that, I mean, this week with the 
passing of President George H. W. Bush, who was the last Cold War president, the last president also to uh, serve in battle. Um, and the president you talk about in the book, who on, uh, ironically, I guess, on September 11, 1990, as part of the justification for going to the war in Iraq the first time, gave this speech about declaring that one of the one of the uh, objects of going to war was to preserve this new world order. In the book, you say, well, it wasn't so much new. You, you, in fact, you don't really see the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, what happened in the 90s, as a real marker in difference in, in any time. I'm curious, why, do, why is that the case? Uh, I think for most people, especially most of the people in this audience who probably don't really remember anything before 1990, uh, it's a really big difference in historical eras, and you sort of see it as a continuous, uh, continuous spectrum. Yeah, I mean, I think that in our, in our, in the way we've lived, for those of us who did were alive during the Cold War and after, and the way our historians and our international relations field treats, there the Cold War looms too large as the as the big thing that happened uh, between World War II and now. It, it might it obviously was very important. We built our whole strategy around it. I'm not saying that. America, and, and America was right to. I mean, I'm not saying that the Soviet Union wasn't a serious threat that had to be dealt with, but I think what we've overshadowed is the far more extraordinary creation of this international system that we know as the liberal world order, which the Soviet Union was outside of, which China was sort of outside of, uh, but it was the transformation, of, for instance, of Germany and Japan from being aggressive dictatorships to being peaceful, democratic, economically oriented powers that basically uh, gave up geopolitical ambition, as did France and Britain, the world's two great empires that had dominated much of the previous two centuries. They also gave up geopolitical ambitions. And a lot of what we saw, at, what we believed was the new era, you know, after the end of the Cold War, people were saying, well, now we move from geopolitics to geoeconomics, was really because as you looked around with the Soviet Union flat on its back and China in a kind of post Tiananmen, uh, you know, situation, all, the only world that you saw was the was this liberal world order that had been created, which had changed uh, all the rules. And I think that the Soviet Union's fall was a product of the success of the liberal world order. And I also try to emphasize in the book because it's just common misconception. It's almost universal. This is what Graham Allison even thinks that the liberal world order was created in response to the Soviet Union, when in fact the basic outlines and even some of the policies uh, of the United States were, occurred during World War II before anyone thought the Soviet Union was going to be an adversary. And so then the Soviet Union kind of fit into a mold of threat that we had already, that in a way the founders had already, you know, prepared for, and the liberal order defeated it. So for me, I just was trying to rebalance our understanding uh, of what actual, what the sort of most important events of the past 70 years have been. And the other reason, I'm sorry to go on so long, but the other reason is that uh, so many people, again, including our brightest uh, international relations theorists, thought that since the, the liberal world order was created, in their view, in response to the Cold War, that when the Cold War ended, we didn't need to do it anymore. Uh, and that was a terrible misconception for which I think we are paying, because I think that's the American public's general view since the end of the Cold War, is that now that the Soviet Union's gone, we can go back to, as Gene Kirkpatrick said in 1990, I think it was 1990 or 91, we can go back to being a normal nation again. So why do you think this conversation is happening now? I mean, yes, obviously there's some of the American withdrawal in various places, the way President Trump talks about things, but there's a series of books really by the so-called realists you talk about that's coming out now and not, let's say, in around 9-11, where you figured a, 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 it would have sparked a bigger conversation amongst the American people about what role the United States should play. So what's, what's changed now compared to where we were 15 years ago? I think these people are being listened to more. It's, it's not even true. They've been writing the same book over, and as have I, by the way, but they've been writing the same book <laughs> over and over again over for 25 or 30 years. I mean, Steve Wolf didn't just decide recently that America is too engaged in the world. John Mearsheim is writing this stuff uh, forever. I just think that although they feel like they're left out of our, you know, elite whatever foreign policy establishment, they're in tune with where the country is, I think, is what's happened. I think the country has come around <laughs> to that view. In my view, the country's attitude toward America's role, role in the world 
began to change almost immediately after the end of the Cold War. Because as I say, the rationale in there, in the general public's mind for why we had this vast defense budget, why we were engaged all around the world, was as a response to Soviet communism. And so I think as you look at the various interventions that were undertaken uh, around the world, each one of them faced pretty substantial uh, domestic opposition, usually partisan opposition, but nevertheless substantial domestic opposition, except for, ironically, the second Iraq war because of 9-11. Um, but I think what we saw was a building resistance on the part of the American people to this role, including pressure on the defense budgets to pay for it. Um, and then Iraq and Afghanistan and the financial crisis were kind of catalysts that tipped things over and convinced the American people and then made it possible for politicians like Barack Obama, like Donald Trump, and intellectuals like realists who've been making the same point even during the Cold War, now to really capture what Americans were thinking. But, but you think that it's different this time around, right? Because what you're saying here and also in the book is that this somewhat aversion or unwillingness to play this role has existed from the get-go at the same time, whether it's Vietnam or other aspects of it. In fact, in the early days after World War II, the Germans certainly thought that, oh, well, we could cooperate with Stalin and create this world order with them and withdraw troops from Korea. And at some point, Truman proposes actually giving the U.S. Uh, nuclear program over to the U.N. And then things do quickly change. So this sort of, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to call it bipolar, but attitude is there from the beginning. So why is, the, why is now different to you than each of the previous times? Well, I think that the, the, the brief moment when Truman and, and most Americans thought we could bring the, the, the boys home, as they put it in those days, um, ended as soon as someone was able to say or to make a case that the Soviet Union looked a lot like the Germany that we didn't do enough about in 1938. And so it was so fresh after the World War II and 1930s experience in the Soviet Union easily fit into that. So it was a pretty brief window. Um, and then I would say throughout the Cold War, fear of communism, which was a special fear for Americans because it combined not only strategic fear with, with fear of domestic <laughs> subversion, which Americans since the founding have always been uh, especially acutely concerned about. I mean, there was a time when we were worried that either the French revolutionaries or the British monarchists were going to take over America. So there's always this great fear uh, that can be kindled, and, this, and so the combination of the fear of communism and the strategic problem posed by the Soviet Union was enough basically to keep Americans at a relatively high level of global engagement, even despite setbacks that were far worse than Iraq. I mean, Vietnam is a, is a, is a tremendously greater uh, military cause in terms of cause, in terms of lives lost, in terms of fracturing of society. It dwarfs Iraq, and yet Vietnam, we, the United States essentially recovered from Vietnam in, in you know, five or seven years, and then elected Ronald Reagan, who was the most hawkish president since Harry Truman. Whereas Iraq, which is, a, as I say, it's a much smaller um, loss, in a sense, than Vietnam was, if, that, if you want to call it a loss. But if you say the worst things you want to say about Iraq, it doesn't compare with Vietnam, and yet we are still talking about Iraq as if that's the most important thing that happened over the last 30 years of our history. And it's enough for many Americans to say, we don't want to be in this business anymore. To me, what that means is not that Iraq was so terrible. It's that the underlying sort of premises of American foreign <clears throat> policy no longer carry any weight. And that's because of the end of communism and this belief that, therefore, we don't have to play this role in the world. So it was much more easily toppled by a lesser catastrophe. So today, in, in Washington elsewhere, talk of the national interest, or the more narrowly defined American interest is more in vogue. And in the book you write, quote, the United States could not be in the game to win every point. They had to be willing to cooperate in ways that might sometimes offer greater benefit to others. This was the difference between taking on, quote, international responsibility for a liberal order and pursuing national interest in a normal, traditional manner. Basically, what you're saying is that in order to get others to acquiesce to this US-led liberal world order, we had to deliberately clip our wings, whether that's through the UN on some matters, uh, WTO on others. Uh, and so deliberately not pursuing our normal national interest, not seeing ourselves in competition with some of our allies, is actually not a bug of the system, but a feature. So German pacifism is a feature of the, of the system you're talking about. So given where we are today, 
uh, in the last 10 years in that way. Can the United States get a better deal while still preserving this order? Can we get others to step up without stepping back, or are the two fundamentally compatible? <coughs> it's certainly been a challenge because obviously uh, Donald Trump's not the first president to ask allies to spend more on defense. And by the way, I don't think he's actually going to get that much more defense spending in the long run. I mean, if you talk to Germans in a non-public setting, uh, they will tell you that if they get up to, I don't even know what, 1.5% or something like that in the next 10 or 15 years, that'll be a very... Because it, it, we are talking about huge increases in the German... German has a huge economy, so it, in order to, the percentages lead to huge numbers, and there's no stomach in Germany spending that kind of money, and I don't think you're going to see it, except in frontline states that, that directly fear the, the Russia, Russians, uh, you're not going to get that kind of defense money. But be that as it may, let's just say that he's got more. He's got more by be doing something that no previous president could do, which is to look credible in saying that he's going to walk away from the alliance. Um, and so we've always been in this sort of difficult psychological situation where you want to tell the allies they need to do more and if you don't do if they don't do it you better watch out but we never were really credible uh, in walk in saying we were going to walk away from the alliance so it's a little bit like because Trump actually does want to walk away from the alliance the allies are willing to spend more or at least in theoretically talk about spending more unfortunately the net result of that is the alliance is going to break down if we continue along these lines I mean Trump is treating the allies in a way worse than he treats adversaries because um, you know he talks about his great respect for Xi Jinping he basically insults Angela Merkel um, he's gonna cut some kind of deal with the Chinese on trade uh, but he still talks about how the Germans need to be you know need to cut back etc cetera, etc cetera. so he's not distinguishing between allies and adversaries anymore and basically if you get you know in dealing in getting to the core of all this you, you quoted this, the section where I'm basically talking about the grand bargain that the order was based on. The, 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 the grand bargain was these countries will accede to the fact that the United States is the only geopolitical player in the living world order, has a, a near monopoly of power in the living world order, because we wanted it that way, because we didn't want Germany to rearm, we didn't want Japan to rearm, etc. But in exchange for with it, we have to make it possible for them to succeed as geoeconomic players. Uh, which means allowing them to flourish. That was our policy for them to flourish. Uh, and, you know, I don't believe that the whole order is actually rules-based, but we did create a rules-based economic order which would sort of level the playing field. If we wanted to, this is what Trump is taking advantage of now, we had a situation where we're the strongest power in the world. We also have the biggest market in the world and the most attractive market in the world. If we want to squeeze the last <coughs> dollar everybody, out of everybody, we'll get better deals. But then you've broken the compact, and then you're going to send countries heading off in their own directions, and then we return to what the world looked like before we had this miraculous uh, situation. So Trump is like someone who's coming into a company that's doing really well and, and really making huge profits, but is also paying its workers very well. So he's coming in, and his big innovation is he's going to cut worker salaries. So the result is you're going to have a higher profit margin, but eventually you're going to destroy the company. And I feel like that's what he's doing to this order. He's taking advantage of a situation that can be taken advantage of, and yes, we'll get better deals. But, the, but, uh, but what if the end result is that the whole thing falls apart? What happened on his watch? But, so, but to be fair, uh, if you look at... I am being fair. If you look, <laughs> if you look at, uh, over the course of many decades, comments from a variety of European leaders about how they feel about American power and American leadership, it's not a recent phenomenon, let's say, in the last you know, 20 months or so, that they're visibly upset European or Asian in a variety of ways. And my, my favorite uh, uh, polling of whether it's Pew or Chicago, where they, they actually poll European countries about their views of the United States or American leadership or confidence in American leadership, you know, you look under George W. Bush, it's in the 20s and the 20s. Miraculously, in 2008, it jumps up to in the 60s or 70s, and then miraculously, in 2016, it jumps back down into the 20s. And the case you're making here, you would not make the case about George W. Bush. So the flip side of the coin about what is the reaction we see from these allies within Europe or Asia or elsewhere, you know, how do you, you know, it's not, I don't want to say it's the boy who cried wolf, but at the same time, there is a longer history to this. 
No, right, and it's exactly this. This, I mean, you're, you're making a, a solid point. It's a I point that a lot of fair. people make, but <laughs> but it's exactly what is wor what worries me about our inability to distinguish between these phenomena. I mean, yes, the alliance has been gone through numerous crises, um, and there. And by the way, being the United to be the United States is to spark resentment. I mean, there's no, there's never been a shortage of resentment even among closest allies. Read the novels of John le Carre if you want to know how the British feel about American leadership, okay? Um, but the question is people, you know, ultimately countries vote with their, with their pocketbooks and with their defense budgets. And for all the grumbling about the United States, no one ever left the order. You know, they had the opportunity. Europe could have set itself up as an independent entity if it wanted to, and they, did, they chose not to because they basically preferred the American order as more benevolent than the alternatives. So now, yes, so they, they were able to complain about Bush. I'm not worried about Europeans complaining. I'm worried about what we're doing. And, it's one, and so the Europeans were foolish to complain about Bush as much as they did. But they're not foolish to worry about Trump the way they do. We've never had a president in history, including during the so-called isolationist period, who was so actively attempting to undermine liberalism in Europe as the current, as our current president is doing. You know, he does not favor, unlike all past presidents, either the center-right or the center-left establishment parties in European countries. He favors the populist, nationalist, right-wing parties, or not right-wing, as the case may be, uh, that are seeking to topple the liberal order. We have a president who's actively hostile to the world, to the world order the United States created. That's a different category. Can, can you think they distinguish, the Europeans distinguish between, in, in your book you sort yeah. of talk about, and correct me if the milestones are right, you sort of put 1945 till 2008 almost in one category, and use 2008, I don't mean simply Obama's yeah. election, but it's the financial crisis, the Russian invasion of Georgia is sort of a, a switch, but in the book you talk about how Obama, you know, let the jungle grow back and we're at weakness, and Trump, like you said, is more out of intent. But, do our allies, the flip side of the coin, do they distinguish how America was under George W. Bush versus Obama versus Trump? I, you know, I don't know. I, I think they do. I mean, you know, I think even in retrospect, there are a lot of Europeans who have, I, I don't think, I've heard them say, you know, we never thought we'd be nostalgic for George W. Bush. Um, but, but they do recognize, I think, especially because Bush's second term was so much dedicated to repairing transatlantic relationships. The, the irony is George W. Bush actually really cared what Europeans thought. He cared so much that he made the mistake of listening to Tony Blair on whether to have a second vote in the UN Security Council because Blair really wanted it. I mean, he was in a certain sense a transatlantically oriented president. I think the Europeans could tell something about Obama which even though they loved Obama, they loved everything about what Obama represented, they also knew that Obama didn't care at all about Europe in a kind of deep way, that, in the deep way that most previous presidents had. And now I think they know that Donald Trump is actively hostile to Europe in a way that they may have been mad at George W. Bush for not listening to Europe, but now they have a president who's actively hostile to Europe. So I don't know, I, I think they understand the difference. However, it doesn't matter. I don't want to make a. I, I do want to make this point. We spend a lot of time worrying about how other countries feel about us, but at the end of the day, they're just like everyone else. They just want to know what we're doing for them. You know, for most countries, it's just: Are you there for us? Or are you not there for us? Uh, we can like you, we can hate you, we can love you, we can admire you, we can not admire you. But we will. What we really care about is: Are you there for us? And that's going to be what determines how things go forward is the perception of our Japanese and other Asian allies, our perception of our European allies, as to whether they're other, as to whether we're there for them. And so I think we're sending the signal increasingly that we're not, and therefore they're going to have to start figuring out what to do about that. So two more questions for me, and then, and then I want to open it up. So uh, first, and, and prompted by the fact that you brought up uh, Dean Kirkpatrick, and you talk about in the book, which is during the Cold War, yes, we associate ourselves with a lot of individuals and countries that may or not may not share our ultimate end goal of wanting this liberal order the way you define it and others define it, but they are also concerned about the jungle in a different way. Right? And whether it's Stalin in World War II, during the Cold War, or today, obviously you can think about Saudi Arabia among others. So can we join forces with entities that don't want what we want but are willing to fight with us for different reasons? How do you how do you handle that? Well, 
I mean, on the on the one hand, at the most sim simple level, you want to say, of course, we have to be willing to be allies with people we don't agree with, because that's just the way the world is sometimes. But I, I, I actually think that we sometimes kid ourselves, even in believing that they're fighting the same battle that we're fighting. And I think it was often the case during the Cold War that we thought that just because a, a, a dictatorship that we liked was, was anti-communist, therefore we were together anti-communist. But of course that dictatorship was concerned with preserving themselves in power. And sometimes that meant, in a way, objectively helping the communists. Because m many a dictator used the fact that it was them or the communists to get more support from us. That led them to crush the non-communist opposition that we would have favored. This is what Somoza did. Uh, in Nicaragua. There was a moderate opposition in Nicaragua. Somoza made sure that they were the ones who got locked up uh, because they knew, he knew that we at America might support them over him. It's better, it was better for him if it was just him or the communists, and I'm sure that that is what's going on now. That's what, that was Mubarak's game in Egypt, and it's also Sisi's game today, which is, you know, it's not, if it were one thing, I, I personally don't think he should be locking up and torturing you know, tens of thousands of members and suspected members of the Muslim Brotherhood, but but in addition to that, he's also locking up liberals and human rights activists um, and any potential independent moderate force in Egypt because those are the ones that he's worried we will ultimately we will wind up supporting. So we think they're fighting our fight with us, but they're doing their own thing, and it doesn't necessarily lead to our advantage. And the thing that cracks me up about the Pans to Jean Kirkpatrick, you know, who I, I liked a lot and I thought, you know, was the, had some wonderful qualities. But the most recent one is, um, you know, Mike Pompeo citing her at the end of his op ed on Saudi Arabia. And, and, you know, if you think about what happened in Iran, the problem was not that we pulled the rug out from under the Shah. The problem is that we stuck with the Shah well beyond the point at which he was no longer a viable leader of his country. And we actually went down with a ship that if we were truly more cynical, we would have abandoned, you know, earlier. And so, and we made the same mistake with Somoza too. So, um, as I say, there will obviously be times when we're going to have to make deals and be allied to people that are not don't live up to the kind of standards we would like. But um, we 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 are far too persuaded uh, that they are actually allies in this struggle rather than. Uh, in a way, working against our interests. So, last question for me. So, you said, I think half jokingly, you've been making the same argument for years and writing the same book over and over again. Uh, who, what is the argument against that you consider the best? Who, who's the person that's actually argued against you that has actually made you stop and think and revise, tweak, whatever your own argument? Because it's clearly not the so-called realists you deride. So, but there must be somebody else, a foil, that you actually think makes it concrete. And in many ways, it might be the scariest for you because it's the most formidable argument that's arguing against you. Look, the, the biggest, it's not so much anybody's argument. It's the fact of the, the moral and actual human costs of the policy that we that I think we have to conduct. I mean, it, the fact that people are going to lose their lives if the United States exercises power. The fact that when we exercise power, it's in, and this is something that we just don't want to have to face. It's inevitable that we're going to make mistakes. We're going to make mistakes of judgment about when to use force. We're going to make mistakes about judgment about how to use force. Um, there is no. When you when when someone is getting killed, there's no good way to get killed. So there is a, a huge moral uh, weight that comes with recommending this kind of policy. And the only way you can get around that moral weight is to is to believe that the alternative is going to be so much worse. And that is the lesson of the 1930s. But then. Even so, not everything is the 1930s, and you're going to take actions which are going to go bad, and, and that's a problem. So, so you know, when people say you need to have modesty and all, uh, etc., about the things that you're recommending, that that is to me the best argument against it. And maybe, you know, the best argument is you may be right about all the bad things that are going to happen, but the things that we have to do to prevent them from happening are also awful. So maybe we should just hope for the best.
you know, and in a way, I, that is to me the best counter argument. I have yet to hear an actual alternative strategy that doesn't produce uh, the kind of disasters that I think are out there. So uh, it's hard for me to be persuaded that there is a better way to do this, but it doesn't mean that I'm happy about having to do it, if, if that makes any sense. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's uh, open it up to questions and discussion. So, uh, is there a microphone roaming around or not? There, there are two mics, I guess, uh, one on either side. So, if you guys want to stand up uh, and just say your name and affiliation and then question mark at the microphone because I think we're filming. Yeah, you can so, line up sorry, on either end. Uh, the other one's in the corner over there. So, uh, but why don't we start over here? Sorry. Thank you for the talk, sir. Um, my question is really quick. Name, is, name and affiliation. Oh, sorry. Ryan Richardson from Lidos. Um, but I used to work for the Foreign Policy Initiative, where Dr. Fagan was a proud core member. I assume proud. Um, <laughs> my question is with Senator McCain, now recently passed, and so many congressional Republicans uh, falling in line with the president due to his political appeal uh, or otherwise, who are the political champions today of the philosophy you espouse in Joe Biden's back? Uh, none. <laughs> There's a yes, sir. short answer, and I'll give you a, I mean, do a short question, I'll give you a short answer. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I look at some of the new members uh, who just got elected in Congress, some of the Democrats, and I won't name them because I don't want to, you know, ruin their political career before we get started. Um, I think help them is they that. have, you know, they have a kind of national security background. They've grown up in a world that's increasingly dangerous and visibly so. Um, and there's a chance that there will be a younger crop <coughs> of uh, people coming up um, in the political in environment who may embrace at least some the, the general direction of this. I do find, you know, I've been asked to come up and talk to senators about, uh, sitting senators about it. I don't think they want to talk to me just because they think it's the most ridiculous thing they've ever heard. So, you know, I think there's some, there's still some hope out there. There, But I can't, there's no single, you know, politician um, that I can see on the horizon who is sort of obviously embracing this. I mean, there was a time I would have said Lindsey Graham, but I don't know what Lindsey Graham thinks about anything anymore. So um, it, it's just hard to see at the moment. Uh, given that our current president was not a previous uh, office holder, might there be anybody in the private sector or elsewhere that, well, <laughs> yeah, uh, undoubtedly there are hundreds. <laughs> I just, I don't know who they are. <laughs> uh, my name is Fred Bartos from the Heritage Foundation. On the risk of being two analogies to the ground, uh, you mentioned that uh, Trump is a, like a, the owner of a, a factory and uh, employees might be get disgruntled when he's trying to cut their benefits or cut their salaries. And is do they have an option somewhere else to work in the international scenario? And that also goes to the jungle analogy, because you can see a Chinese garden being Built. Is that a viable alternative? Would some countries see that as a viable alternative, or would they rather go to the jungle than to go to the Chinese Garden? It, it's a very good question, and it, and it and it's it's an important question because, by and large, if if countries are looking for someone else to provide them security and let them live the way they want to live, the way the United States has. They don't have another alternative, and in a way, that's what makes the current situation somewhat resilient, despite all the pressures that are on it. The alternative that other countries have is to fend for themselves. Um, they're not going to find. There is not going to be all of a sudden a unified Europe that is going to stand up and look after common interests. If Europe, Europe is heading in the opposite direction uh, from that right now. Um, but what I think people, but and yet we shouldn't be sanguine about that fact because just take Japan for an instance. Japan has an alternative. Japan can rearm uh, more than it already is. It's already one of the largest military powers in the world. And in in 24 hours, it could it could become a nuclear nation, and probably within I don't know how many weeks could probably have hundred hundreds of nuclear weapons. Which means that we would be, and you know, which would mean that Korea would have to make the decisions it would have to make, Australia would have to make the decisions it would, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, what you wind up having is not an alternative order, but a return to the competitive Asia 
uh, of the past, uh, or maybe with, with new wrinkles, with China being able to hold its own instead of just being a victim of Japanese depredation. So you're going to have a multipolar, a multipolar conflict in Asia of nuclear armed powers. That, that, that's, that's the more likely future. That is the alternative. And we can drive people toward that alternative. In the case of Europe, I think Europe can just, be, again, head, you know, I, I, I don't want to overdo the sort of historic, I'm not a historical determinist, but structures are already are in place. And it's possible for countries basically to return onto the ruts they were on before the United States basically shoved them out of those ruts after World War II. And a renationalized Europe um, is not impossible right now. And I've talked to many Germans about this. And let me tell you, even though we, you know, the Germans are the most liberal Pacific people we know today, but if all the countries around them have renationalized and the old resentments against Germany's wealth and power return, and they, no reason, they're already there to some extent, um, how long before Germany, simply out of the need to take care of itself, uh, starts to pursue, uh, you know, power in a traditional fashion. And so those are the, that's, that's where they go. They, they go back, <laughs> in a sense. Uh, my name is Jake Kateri. I'm a uh, strategic studies student at SAIS. And it was uh, such a cheerful talk, I had to go refill my Good, I'm glad you did. <laughs> uh, my question is that, uh, it, do the Europeans share any responsibility for having been uh, their leaders having been irresponsible to bring their people to this point and also by uh, occasionally and very often uh, undermining the United States by creating a resentment against themselves inside the United States and if they are how a future responsible United States president can uh, fix that or work with them to overcome this challenge. Yeah. That's also a very good question, and obviously the answer to some extent is yes. I, when I when I wrote um, an afterward to Paradise of, to the Paradise and Power book, which was the Mars Venus Europe book, um, I said that America, and this sort of addresses one of the questions you're asking, but the United States needs to make sure that it is operating roughly within what the rest of the order considers a legitimate fashion. It can't just look like it's the rogue superpower. Uh, doing anything it wants because it needs to provide that kind of reassurance. But at the same time, the Europeans, I said, need to be very careful that they're not yelling at the United States so much that eventually Americans stop listening and basically tell the Europeans that they can, you know, go have a nice life. And to some extent, we, that is what's happened. I do think that Europeans, in this kind of Greek chorus mode that Europe was in, you know, commenting on the action from the sidelines and speaking, you know, condemning, uh, you know, in the name of the gods, uh, the behavior of the United States, uh, went a long way toward alienating an American public, which after all, historically, had no love for Europe to begin with. I mean, you want to talk, the aberration is all the transatlantic uh, affinity that we've had since since World War II. So I do think they bear some responsibility. And I was, uh, in a way, they made two bad bets. Um, one was that in the post-Cold War world, power had literally ceased to matter, uh, traditional power, and therefore everything was going to be about geoeconomics. And therefore, the fact that Europeans didn't have military power was a virtue, not a, not a problem. That turned out to be a bad bet. And their other bet was no matter how much they yelled at the United States for having military power and using military power, that nevertheless the United States would always be there with its military power to provide global security. And that may turn out to be a bad bet, too. So, look, there's enough blame to go around. And I don't want to say this is all the Europeans' fault. But yes, they do share, bear some of the burden for this. Hi. Hi, Sam Mellett at the Wilson Center. Um, so, I think a lot of us in the room agree with you about what the United States should be doing in the international order in the world, um, but the problem is we're all in this room. Uh, and the million dollar question is convincing people outside this room, because we can think about what a country should do, but we need to elect leaders that would then pursue that path. Um, so, I think the million dollar question is what's the best way to convince people that this is still in our interest, this is still what's best for the United States to make these sacrifices you were talking about uh, to keep this world order. 
Thank you. Well, let me just say that this is usually, this is a much bigger room than I'm used to finding people who agree. You know, usually we can meet in a much smaller room with all the people who agree about but this. But the books were free. Right. Well, <laughs> and the food is pretty good, and there's wine and everything. But um, no, I mean, look, uh, I am unfortunately under no illusion about how easy it's going to be to turn the American public around on this. And I, I only, I, not to depress you even more, but there's still wine back there, um, just think about the difficulty that Franklin Roosevelt had uh, in the 1930s, in the late 1930s, after Munich, after the invasion of Poland, and even after the fall of France. Um, Roosevelt didn't even dare ask the American people whether um, we whether they thought we should get involved in this war before Hitler conquered absolutely everything, including uh, Great Britain. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was the most gifted politician probably in the history of our country, um, and yet he did not have the ability to convince Americans. Um, I think he was moving in that direction successfully with Lend-Lease and uh, Destroyer Deals and, you know, uh, taking a very forward position in the Atlantic. Uh, but, but Pearl Harbor, for him, was a relief because he was never sure that he was going to be able to bring Americans. He was waiting for Hitler, essentially, uh, to do something that would require Americans to enter the war. But he never simply did what, you, what you're talking about, which is, okay, let's persuade the American people absent uh, something like that to, to turn things around. Now, what we have going for us, the difference between now and the 1930s, is that in the 1930s it meant the United States had to take on a new role that it had never taken on before. And Americans were used to believing that everybody else was supposed to handle this, not them. Um, even though World War I should have told them otherwise. Now we've been in this role for 70 years. So in a way we're giving up a role that we've already had. So I think there's a possibility of holding on longer. But back to the pessimistic side, as I look at the two political parties, I don't see movement toward this approach, I see movement away from it. Um, so that even though the Democrats have gotten themselves all upset about Russia all of a sudden, um, nevertheless, uh, they're going to cut the defense budget when they come in, in the House. And there's no stomach for this policy, I think, in the Democrat, in, mo in most of the Democratic Party. And Republicans are still enthralled uh, to President Trump because they have no choice. So, uh, you know, the, in, in 1979 or 78, you could say, well, there's Ronald Reagan. And by the way, nobody even knew what Ronald Reagan was going to be. But let's say because we know in retrospect there's Ronald Reagan. I don't see a Ronald Reagan getting a nomination in either party anytime soon. So we're in trouble. So what do you, I'm sorry, did you ask what we all should do? We all should just keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, and stop, I, would, I wish we would stop thinking we could solve things through social media. I think you have to deal with people, you know, like one-on-one. -on -one. I think when you, if you go back to your hometowns, you should meet with people. This has got to be, you know, in the old days we used to think you had to have a chapter in every town and meetings and all that kind of stuff. And now we just think if you get something, if you tweet, then you're halfway home. So I would say there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one work that we all need to do. Um, yeah, so I want to start off by saying I also agree with you. Um, and I just name, have, that's name, name, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Keith <laughs> Sweeney from the Ronald Reagan Institute. Uh, so I just had the chance to hear Congressman Adam Smith speak, who's about to become the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. And he was speaking to a group of national security professionals, and he was being pressed on the defense budget, I think also the legacy of John McCain. And he essentially said, well, look, it's not the case that I don't recognize the benefits that have come from an American-led international order and an activist American foreign policy, but we were able to do that because of the, the relative power gap between us and any other potential peer. But now in the 21st century, we live in a reality where regardless of whether or not you believe America is in decline or not, uh, it is a fact that the Chinese have made great strides in closing that relative power gap and that American behavior in the world needs to reflect uh, that change in reality, that we're no longer able to be the sole landscaper of the world um, because the Chinese are growing and that gap is closed. Just wanted to hear you respond to that. Well, I mean, I, even if that analysis were correct, I don't. what is the prescription there for? I mean, I don't know where that's supposed to go. If I, I'd be curious to hear what, what Congressman Smith has to say. 
because one answer, which some people have given, Peter Barnard wrote a piece uh, on this subject, I guess, in the Atlantic, saying, well, you just have to let the Chinese have their sphere of influence because we're not going to be able to stop them. Well, you know, the Chinese sphere of influence <laughs> includes Japan, just for instance. Um, it, also, it also very much includes Korea. I mean, <laughs> and so... And my social security number. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I think that, you know, what, does that mean we're, we're going to say Japan and China just go at it? Anyway, there's practical consequences from that. Now, as it happens, I don't believe that that's true. And I, I, I you know, the Soviet Union, when, which we're now supposed to think was not worth worrying about, controlled half of Europe. Um, that was a serious problem, uh, in my view. And not to mention, you know, having a lot of uh, allies around the world. You know, China has no allies around the world. It is surrounded by powerful countries who are very much looking to the United States for strategic reassurance. Um, we have the financial capacity to keep up the gap, you know, to, to compete with the Chinese militarily. We are choosing not to. And as far as I understand Congressman Smith's intention, we're going to not compete even more after he gets through with the defense budget. So, you know, on the one hand, I don't know what the prescription is. On the other hand, I don't, I don't believe the analysis. We are capable of continuing to deter China, which is all we have to do. Um, but we will, uh, unfortunately, tragically, fail to deter China, uh, and then we'll be back in uh, the soup. Swivel you one more time. No. <laughs> uh, the AOC and the Foundation for Defense Democracies. Um, you mentioned earlier that it was the Soviet Union in the theater of the Cold War that inspired America to bear the burden of Vietnam and Korea and other such conflicts, whereas today, we get exhausted over the you know, objectively less intense Iraq and Afghanistan war. Uh, so my question is, is there, do you imagine a scenario where Americans, dare I say, peacefully come to this realization that we need to be the landscaper, or are we just waiting for the next Hitler or the next calamity to shock people into once again coming to this realization? I, well, so you ask me what of those options I'm choosing, or, <laughs> or which one you see more likely? Seems no. more likely as you see the one that happens. Well, I'm not going to say which is more likely. I, I'm, I'm going to be hopeful that we will avoid uh, door number two. Um, and not the least because my real concern is not that we might ultimately pull ourselves out of this sort of tailspin that we're in, but that when we do so, you, it will not be possible to pull out of it. Um, as it happened, the United States could get in the game in the fourth quarter um, in 19, at the end of 1941 and, 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 and win the game and turn everything around, uh, as we also did in World War I by our mere presence in a way. Um, there's no reason to assume that if we wait for things to get that bad the next time that we'll still have the wherewithal to be able to come in late in the game uh, and turn things around. You know, the British, if, if you think about the British position in the late 1930s, effectively, they blew it. You know, they, they miscalculated or made the decisions that they made, all of which were perfectly rational decisions. If you go back and look at the decisions that Chamberlain had to make, uh, you should not have contempt for Neville Chamberlain. We're Neville Chamberlain right now, not in the not in the sense of, you know, we've got Munich around the corner, but he was making decisions about, should I take care of the domestic economy and make sure that we're strong in terms of our economy, or should I spend more money on defense? Should I, you know, should I challenge these potential adversaries, or should I try to appease them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they made that calculation, and they were wrong. And if there had been nobody else on the planet, they would have lost. And they would be, you know, under for however long that was going to last. Uh, but fortunately, they had us, the United States, in the wings. The United States could come in, as I say, in the fourth quarter and turn everything around. Where's our United States? You know, so we're in the case of Britain. We can miscalculate, and there's no one waiting in the wings. So I don't want to go to door number two. Well, that, so that begs the question, though. What, what does too late look like? Or what you're describing right now is we still have time yeah. to reinvigorate this 
defend it and so on because it's been right. you know the, the, the vines or whatever are at right. the edges. But and what, that, what, what in, in, in a real applied sense, what right. does two lit look like? I mean, it's hard to. It's obviously very hard to say, and that's because it, you know, as as historians know, conditions can be created for a certain outcome, but it may not happen right away. You know, there may be, you, you need the tipping point or the particular event uh, that triggers the constellation of forces that was existing but not leading to any particular outcome. I, and, and for me, the history of the interwar period is the most instructive because we always think about what we didn't do in the 1930s, but I think the groundwork was laid for all the bad things that happened in the 1920s when everything looked good. And so, uh, but we, you know, we signed a, we had a treaty uh, uh, with the Japanese, which no one thinks about in retrospect, but in, in fact uh, allowed the Japanese to ultimately obtain uh, equality, at least in, in the Far East, which which then ultimately tempted them uh, to to launch a war to drive us out. Um, so decisions that you make today won't have an immediate effect, but they do lay the fundamental foundation for the disaster that's going to come 10 years from now. So, is it was it recoverable after the 1920s? Of course it was, but the trajectory didn't change. And that is, of course, in part of answering answer your question, the hardest thing to do is to take the actions necessary before they're obviously necessary. But if you don't take them, you almost guarantee that they that the outcome is that you don't want. So as I look around the world today, what I fear is that as in the 1930s, we are creating conditions where it won't just be one thing. It'll be a lot of things all happening at the same time. So you'll have Russia putting on more and more military pressure uh, in, in, in on Ukraine and, in, and its other neighbors. Uh, we. Uh, you know, Ambassador Edelman has just come out with a report making very clear that our capacity to fight and deal with two separate contingencies at the same time is practically has practically withered away if it hasn't already withered away. So, you know, when 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 the when the European situation was collapsing in the nineteen thirties, the Japanese could see that it was collapsing. And they they made, so that each each side made its move based on what was happening in the other region. So we've been living in a wonderful world where bad things happen in the Middle East and bad things happen in Russia, and we have to go or in in Europe and we have to go rushing out there to deal with it. Not in Europe, but in the Middle East. And the Chinese have never taken advantage of that situation, even though we've had to strip uh, the Western Pacific of our aircraft carriers and a lot of our other capabilities. The day will come when they will take advantage of it. And then we will have two contingencies at the same time. And then there's so many other things that go on in the world or don't go on in the world because the United States is keeping a lid on them, right? Um, India, Pakistan, it's something the United States continually keeps a lid on. If the United States is out of that business, the India, Pakistans of this world could blow up at any time. Uh, Europe, I think, is in a state of a downward spiral right now. Uh, you could see, we could have an election in France the next election could elect a right-wing nationalist government in France, and then the whole world's going to look completely different. Anyway, I could go on and on. That doesn't even include economic catastrophes, and it doesn't even include the effects of climate change, which, whatever else is true, are going to exacerbate geopolitical crises uh, in the years to come, because the whole world is going to be in a heightened state of anxiety, I believe, if, if even part of some of these predictions uh, come true. So. Uh, I believe, you know, we're heading into a storm, uh, but I feel like we are completely psychologically unready and unrealizing that that's what we're heading into. I think you have a quote in the book, which is, you quote, the sun also rises when asked, how do you, how did you become poor? It's like, well, gradually and then suddenly. No, it's a, it's a great line about the guy who goes bankrupt and they ask him why he went, how he went bankrupt, and his answer is gradually and then suddenly. Um, and that's how, that is how orders uh, collapse, I think, historically. Well, it looks like the last question of the night. Uh, Rich Lavoie with the Laura Ingram Show, just a quick question here. I was wondering, uh, how, how do you square uh, you know, the, the need, of course, uh, as in your book, The Jungle Grows Back, the, the need to maintain security around the world while 
uh, you know, bearing uh, some of the economic costs at home, and which causes a lot of uh, domestic instability, whether it was in the Cold War, uh, seeing a lot of manufacturing to Japan and now to China. Uh, so just your thought, how, how you might be able to balance those two with seeming opposing views of the Yeah. I mean, I, there is this sense that everything we do in terms of foreign policy is a net negative for how things are domestically. And I just think that that is not, you know, historically that's just not true. Um, some of the greatest advances that occurred in the United States, whether you want to talk about civil rights or uh, economically or in terms of infrastructure, a lot of the things that we look back, occurred during the Cold War, occurred during the Vietnam War for that matter. Um, and so I don't think that there is any kind of, this kind of, we can't be nation building abroad because we need to be nation building at home. I mean, history suggests that you actually not only can do both, but often do both. Um, in terms of losing out on trade deals, I mean, so much of, I, I, the, the net advantage to us of global free trade is the, is the best kept secret uh, in the world these days. I don't have the figures off the top of my head, but a substantial portion of everybody's paycheck now is a result of global free trade. The industries that have failed, that have lost out, I believe most of them were going to lose out purely on technological, on the grounds of technological change. We are going through a wrenching reorganization uh, of how people work and what people work on hardly for the first time. This also happened when we moved from being a farm economy to an industrial economy. Um, as these things change, there are always going to be losers. And, and, at the same, and when there are losers, then there's always got to be somebody to point to to explain why they lost. So if you look at the, 19, the 1920 election, by the way, is the best parallel to the election we just had. Um, because at that time, too, there was huge anti-immigration sentiment. There was huge uh, anti-free trade sentiment, you know. We had the biggest, uh, the, the strongest anti-immigration legislation passed in that period. We had the beginning of new tariffs, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of this was displaced political anxiety. There was also racial tension, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan more than they had any in previous time. A lot of this was displaced anxiety as a result of these kinds of structural changes. So we're going through that again. Uh, and the real question is not can you solve all these problems, the real question is can you have a stable enough and effective enough political system that you ride them out and move to the next phase. And unfortunately at this moment, we do not. So let, let me ask, maybe this, since there's nobody else, uh, let me ask the final question, which I, hopefully is a way to end on a positive note. Although it may, I know, we're always desperate. It may, it may, it may, it may, it may backfire, so I may regret it. So, uh, so given where we are now compared to where we were two years ago, and looking back at your own writings about then candidate Trump and president-elect Trump. Yeah, no, this isn't going to go where you want so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, right to right ask another one. But, you better, yeah, but, keep working at it. <laughs> given that, I mean, we've now seen national security strategy, the national defense strategy, plus ups in the defense budget at least for, for two years and so on, uh, is this where you expected us to be compared to where you thought we were going to be two years ago? Did you... Did you are there others, whether others in the administration or the president himself, who sort of you know, certain hat, certainly has a number of instincts about the world and certainly still uh, um, uh, vocalizes them pretty uh, clearly, but at the same time, uh, there's a lot that is not where most people would have predicted we had been two years ago. So is there a way, I guess I'm trying to say it's end positively, yeah. but uh, it may backfire. Should we just go, should we just skip to the next question? So we can end positively? Well, how do you, I, I guess it's how, how do you compare uh, 24 months later a lot of expectations and predictions to where we are today. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, it, the fact that the world didn't blow up in two years doesn't encourage me that things have gotten better, you know? And again, I am reminded in history how often things looked better for a couple of years before everything that everybody predicted going badly actually then went badly. So, um, I, I, but even having said that, the national security strategy is, you know, first of all, so far in terms of actual policy, this administration's Russia policy is not worse than the Obama administration's Russia policy, like and, is, and, is, <laughs> and is arguably and is arguably better so far. I have to see how they're going to respond to the stuff in the Sea of Azov because that's a new kind of challenge. But I don't see a, a, any any particular problem with that. Um, I think it is better. I think that um, relations with our allies is unquestionably worse, although it was already bad under Obama, but it's unquestionably worse. 
Um, in terms of in terms of dealing with China, which I think is the other area people point to, um, I am apparently there is now a, 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 a total national consensus that China is a huge threat that we have to do something about. I'm thrilled to hear that. Eric and I have been saying this for 30 years. I don't know. I'm glad we're there. 20 anyway. 20 anyway. Um, but I also, and you mentioned the defense budget, the, the, what I'm hearing out of the administration is that the, the defense budget is either going to go flat now or, or even in terms of inflation to go down. And so that was fun while it lasted and we're not nearly there. This is when the services are calling for even more, et cetera. And there's going to be, I would say, unity between the White House and the Democratic Party on the defense budget. The question is what are Republicans doing in Congress? You know, what is Liz Cheney? Liz, Liz Cheney. What is Liz Cheney going to do? She's like the third ranking member in the Republican House right now. I want to know how Liz Cheney is going to respond to the to the to the sort of pincer movement coming out of the White House and the Democratic controlled House. So, but then you know, you, then there are all the domestic issues. And look, we are we have not begun to enter the crisis that we're about to you know, that that is going to happen uh, over the Mueller investigation at which point we will find out. If Mueller comes out with what I think he's going to come out with and we don't and the, and thing, and we don't enter into a constitutional crisis, then you can come back and get me here and I'll say things aren't as bad as I thought they were going to be. But I we have not yet seen what this president is going to do when confronted by what I think he's going to be confronted by and a democratic house. And so with the, the jury is now still entirely out on the sort of well-being of American democracy, as far as I'm concerned. Now, do we want to end on a problem? Uh, let me try again. <laughs> uh, you, you, you said that there weren't any political leaders out there that you think represent this. But if you were to have found one, if you were to be advising him or her, how many conditionals are in this uh, <laughs> positive idea? So, what, what, what are what are actually concrete actions or concrete signals that you would like to see? That would signal that you know maybe there are people who take the order you're talking about and it's spirit in defense of it seriously. Look, I mean, as I say, our situation is difficult but eminently salvageable. Okay, and I, you know, if we could just, if I could even, you know, if you could, even Donald Trump could turn this around if he, if with with very little effort actually, if if we could once again reassure our allies that we are allies and that we're going to be there for them and not be raising questions about whether we're going to defend them in a pinch or not and not be making them targets of our trade policies and just go back to being reasonable allies again. And if we, if we actually continue to increase the defense budget, that would send an, a, a signal that's well beyond whatever the impact of the defense budget is, because even though it would be inadequate to meet what Eric is talking about, the mere fact of increasing the defense budget would send a powerful signal around the rest of the world that we're not throwing in the towel, which is what people think we are doing. So um, those two things alone. So if I had a, a, a new member of Congress who had any kind of influence or stood for anything, and by the way, there are such people who in previous times would have done this, get up there and say, we need to stand by our allies and we need to take care, uh, make sure that our military still has the capacity to deter adversaries, we'd be a lot better off than where we are right now, where, as far as I could tell, no one is saying. I'll take that as a positive. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Switch Thank you. Right Thank you, everybody, for joining us. More food, more drink, and there's free books, and if you'll stick around, maybe sign a few. Sure, you uh, uh, People want them. That'll appreciate over time. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.